All right. Hi, guys. So I am out today. Um, I have a doctor's appointment and I'm going to pick up my brother for his doctor's appointment. So kind of a busy day for me. Um, but today is the day that I introduced the unit two uh, major assessment, which is a research argumentative essay. So I wanted to show that to you guys really quickly um, and go through kind of um, what the requirements are, as well as maybe preemptively answer any questions you might have. So I'm going to go ahead and go to my slideshow and see if that comes up. Okay, so you should see in front of you where it says 2021 argumentative essays. So this is going to be the major uh, grade for this particular unit. If you scroll down on the website, you will see that the calendar for unit two is already uploaded as well as this PowerPoint. So you don't have to memorize or pause or anything, but you're more than welcome to do so. So some basic tips, please make sure that you do not put this off to the last minute. Um, we've been doing this long enough, uh, and I speak for all of the 11th grade teachers here, that we can pretty much tell if you wait to the last minute to do this. Um, so please don't do that. It's pretty obvious to us. Uh, additionally, if you look at the calendar, you will see that we have checkpoints in place so that it's going to be kind of difficult for you to put this off to the last minute. Your first step is to decide whether or not the essay that you have chosen, the topic that you've chosen is considered to be a um, problem solution or just a straight persuasive essay. And that's important because it's two different structures that you're going to use. It's a different structure for your thesis and it's a different structure for the overall essay. Um, it's actually um, Sophoclean versus Aristotelian in structure. Not that you need to know that, but for those of you that are all, all interested in that. Um, so you need to pick your topic and then from your topic, you need to figure out um, of that topic, which one is it? And the announcements are gonna come on in a second and I'm gonna say the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> so just bear with me. Um, in a moment when the announcements come on, you'll see me do that. So just, you can just fast forward that part of that video. Um, okay, so the next thing that you need to figure out um, as far as persuasive versus problem solution, what's the difference? Persuasive is when you highlight a thing and you say that this is a thing that is either good or bad or just is. So for example, if you wanted to say um, that racism exists, that would be a persuasive topic. If you wanted to say that um, feminism is bad, that would be a persuasive topic. It would just be a straight persuasive top topic and it's not a problem solution. A problem solution essay on the other one, on the other hand, is when you actually give a solution to the problem itself. So you say, this is a problem that exists and here is my solution for that particular problem. Um, it, it's not easier one way or the other to do you know, whichever one. I actually find problem solution essays to be easier than just persuasive essays because Oftentimes in persuasive essays is if you're highlighting a problem, if you're highlighting a problem, you have a tendency to kind of fall into, oh, but you could probably fix it in this way. At least I do. Um, so I find problem solution essays easier. Um, it just sort of depends on you, but you have to decide. Like you have to choose your topic and you have to decide of these two categories, which one uh, seems to fit my topic. So I know that's hard and we're like, I don't wanna categorize, I don't wanna do any of those things. Like, that's not what I'm about, Ms. Kohanna. I'm like, but you have to, but you have to. You have to choose a structure and you have to go in that particular structure direction. Otherwise, what will end up happening, sometimes this happens to you guys as early writers, is you will be kind of all over the place. And so you'll get notes from your teachers that are things like, your structure is really hard to follow or your logic is really hard to follow. And I will warn you now, as a former debate coach, that's one of the things that I'm really looking for is how careful are you about following logic uh, when it comes to your argumentation. So hang on one second, I'm just gonna say the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. So when we're talking about doing your essay and choosing your topic, choose your topic, get a general idea of your topic, but then immediately decide before you start your research or anything else. Sorry. Before, before you do anything else, hey, which one is it? Is it problem solution or is it argumentative? At 7.30 a.m. in room 5201. Have a great day, Eagles. 
So these are some examples of problem solution topics. So the first one, the United States federal government should su substantially increase social services for persons living in poverty in the United States. That is a very specific national interest, right? So like if I'm talking talking about a topic in this, in in this instance, it is very specific to the United States. It's the United States finding a solution for the United States. Okay, look at the second topic. The, the U.S. should substantially reduce its military and or police presence in one or more foreign countries. That's a global topic, but the actor, the one who is doing the problem solving is the United States. So you'll see in problem solution essays, you have to name who is gonna fix the problem. Is it the United States? Is it individuals? If you're finding yourself unable to find an actor, the person who's going to solve the problem, you might wanna go back and take a look and maybe your topic is too broad, either narrow it down or maybe you're actually looking at an argumentative topic, which I'll show you some examples of in a minute. NASA should get more funding. That's pretty obvious, right? That's a national topic. Who is the actor? The actor would be the federal government. What are they doing? They are giving more money to NASA. Uh, Georgia's government should invest more money in transportation infrastructure. So again, that is a very, that's a local topic, right? That's a state-based topic, um, but we can name who the actor. Who is the actor? Georgia is the actor. And then, I think the last one, hang on, let me see if I can move this. School should allow pets in the classroom, okay? So that one's gonna be a little bit more broad in scope, but it's a should statement. So you'll see that each of these has a should, 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 should. If your thesis statement, if your topic has a should in it, it's probably a problem solution topic, okay? Here are some uh, examples of persuasive topics. Intel processors are better than AMD or PlayStation 4 is better than um, Nintendo Switch or you know whatever you wanna do. So the topics themselves, when you first start off, you may find that the topics themselves don't have to be all that serious and that's fine. Just know that your requirements are to find one peer journal, right? So one peer reviewed journal, so it has to be a scientific journal, which you may not find if you're doing PlayStation 4 versus Nintendo Switch, a news article, and then a book, right? So like the requirements, which I'm gonna go over in a minute, may limit your ability to do some of these kind of fun topics. So just keep that in mind. Um, depression is on the rise among teens, which is dangerous. Notice that there's no actor, there's no solution here. It's just, this is a thing and this thing is bad. Morality is not a natural, natural condition and is only taught. Man is not born with natural morality. Video games are the future of education and literature. Driving for Uber and other gig jobs are the future of 21st century employment. Being a professional athlete is a viable career uh, in the 21st century. So these are all persuasive topics. Either something is um, or something isn't or something is good or is not good, okay? So the number one thing that I will get, pretty much two kids in every classroom try this on me. So they try to argue the inarguable. So don't try to argue the inarguable. Please do not attempt to find sources that prove that vanilla ice cream is the best ice cream because it's your favorite. Okay, that's a begging the question logical fallacy. Um, please do not try to find sources that say death is not real. Like I understand that all of you guys are going through this weird absurdist uh, artistic movement right now where you're questioning reality, and I understand that, but that is not something that you're gonna be able to argue in a three-page research paper. Please do not try to argue that you are God. Please do not try to argue that I am God. Please do not try to argue that life is not real or that we are trapped in the matrix. And it's not because I don't think that those topics are interesting and funny and would be a fun thing to read about. It's because you literally only have three pages and you also have to find three sources. So a lot of those are way too personal to who you are um, and to your spe specific station. Um, and it's just not something that you're gonna be able to do seriously. And I wanna make sure that you get a good grade on this, okay? So again, you're not gonna be able to solve the problem of fear, right? So you're gonna do a problem solution essay, you can't solve fear. Like that is not something that is possible, all right? So again, this PowerPoint that I'm going through right now is uploaded to Kohanim Web. So please don't feel like you have to memorize this, although it will be helpful for you in the long run, because these are the two types of essays for the most part that you're gonna encounter in college. No matter what your major is, you will encounter either a problem solution essay or an argumentative essay, and chances are you'll probably do a whole bunch of both. So how do you start it off? The first thing for every essay is a hook sentence. You want to pull your audience in, right? 
for a problem solution, you are going to tell them what is the thing that's happening right now. So let's go back to NASA should get more funding. You would give two sentences after your hook sentence that say something along the lines of space exploration is going to be the future of generations because Earth itself is running out of resources. That would be sentence number one. Sentence number two would be something along the lines of right now, NASA is so completely and totally underfunded that private enterprise are starting to take over our skyways and they are leaving trash in our uh, stratosphere. Okay, so those would be two bad things that are happening right now because the problem of the problem solution essay exists, right? Then you're going to explain why that's important. Um, so you, one sentence approximately, um, humans will run out of the resources uh, if we carry on with our growth of population within the next 100 years, um, and we are going to need a new place to live that is not this earth, period. One sentence, right? And then finally, the very last sentence is going to be how you will solve this problem. So that's one sentence, and it's your thesis statement, and it would be, you know, the United States federal government needs to substantially increase its funding to NASA in order to solve the problem of uh, space exploration being privatized and um, l resources running out on Earth, okay? Here's the persuasive introduction. And this particular introduction is very similar and yet a little bit different. So the first is a hook sentence. And again, that's where you're gonna pull your audience in. Then you're going to explain why you are an expert. So let's say, for example, that you wanted to say, um, Becoming a professional athlete is a viable career choice for the 21st century. You would establish ethos. And remember, Aristotle explains to us, which you should have learned in like seventh and eighth and ninth and 10th grade, ethos is the authority. Why are you an authority? You might say something along the lines of, I've been playing football since I was, you know, nine years old with my dad in my backyard. So I've studied a great deal about this particular subject. Hey, Kohanim, I'm not an expert on this. Like I plan to do research on it, but I don't consider myself an expert. Okay, why did it interest you? Give me some ethos as to why it, this particular topic interests you. If it's persuasive in nature, why do you care? That would be establishing your ethos. Then you're going to tell the audience why they should care, okay? So uh, you're going to establish some pathos. And remember Aristotle says pathos is the appeal to the emotion. Why should your audience care whether or not football playing is like a professional, a viable professional career in the 21st century? And you might mention something about the fact that, you know, a lot more attention has been paid lately to um, football players brain injuries, right? Traumatic brain injuries and the long term effects of that. And if that is going to be a viable career, it's something that we need to pay attention to. Right. And then you're going to give me your thesis statement. Being a professional football player in the 21st century is a viable career because of blank and blank, right? So you're going to give me two prongs or three. So here's some example. The here's an example thesis for a problem solution essay. The Georgia State Legislature should increase teacher salaries to decrease teacher turnover and to ensure the most qualified teachers are in the classroom. So this is a two prong example. So take a look. The first body paragraph is going to talk about getting rid of teacher turnover. So statistically, like the most well-known statistic is that like 80, I think it's like one in five, one in five teachers will leave the profession in the first three years. Um, so that could be something that you bring up and that would be your first body paragraph talking about teacher turnover and teachers leaving the classroom. And then the second body paragraph would be to ensure that qualified teachers are in the classroom. So there's a whole bunch of alternative pathways to being a teacher now, and some of them don't even require um, a high school diploma. So if you wanted someone who didn't have a high school diploma teaching a high school class, then you know that's something that we probably need to take a look at, right? So those are my two body paragraphs. Hey, Kohanim, can I have more than two body paragraphs and more than two prongs? Absolutely, these are just examples. So here's a persuasive essay thesis. This one starts with an although, and I love starting a, a persuasive thesis with an although because it like takes a look at the other side, 
right? It acknowledges the counter argument within the thesis statement, which I think is very powerful. Um, and that's actually Cisnerian. But um, although dreams can motivate someone to achieve a goal, facing reality is far more important because chasing a dream fruitlessly can lead to disillusionment or peril. So the first body paragraph is going to be about disillusionment, which is basically like you don't care about life anymore because your dreams aren't being fulfilled. And then the second body paragraph is going to be about peril. In this case, peril could be something like death. So some style notes that I want you to keep in mind when we're talking about your research paper. I've seen a lot of kids include rhetorical questions and I'm just going to, let me move this over here. I'm just gonna let you read that to yourself. And you can pause the video and read it. I think it's something that middle schools actually teach kids to do as kind of like a, the training wheels for writing, which training wheels are very important, but you guys are in high school now and you don't need training wheels anymore. So please don't ask a rhetorical question and then answer your rhetorical question. Also don't overly rely on rhetorical questions to transfer you from, transition you from one paragraph to another. This is my face when I read that. Um, okay, so let's talk about passive voice because that's something that we want to try to um, eliminate when we are doing more academic writing, okay? So passive voice emphasizes the receiver of the action. So for example, the man was chased. Active voice emphasizes the doer of, of the action or the actor, right? AKA zombies chased the man. So if you're not sure whether or not something is passive or active, try putting by zombies at the end. And if by zombies at the end works, that means it's probably passive voice. So we wanna try to avoid passive voice if we can. And that's just a style issue. Um, other style issues, transitions, they are not just from paragraph to paragraph, but from idea to idea. So if you've ever gotten awkward or hard to follow on any of your papers, it may not be that your transitions from paragraph to paragraph are bad. It may actually be, be that your transitions within the paragraphs themselves are kind of hard to follow. Um, so make sure when you're going from one idea to another in a paragraph, you're leading your reader along so that they don't suddenly go, wait, where did that come from? That seems out of place, right? Try to also avoid short and choppy sentences, and you want to vary your word choice and your sentence structure. So what are the requirements of this paper, Kohanim? So you'll see on the left-hand side here, I've got an example of the paper itself. Um, and you'll see that in the upper left-hand corner, it's an MLA heading, which of course is required. Um, it must follow the MLA format requirements. So that means that you have to have your last name and then the page number, which I'm gonna show you how to format all of those things. Um, and you need to have an MLA heading in the upper left-hand corner. You will notice that there is a title. You need to have a title for your paper. It's not the first thing that you will do. Most likely it will be the last thing that you do, um, but it needs to be centered. It needs to be not bold, not italicized, not spaced differently, not higher fontage. So that means it needs to be 12 point times new Roman double spaced, okay? Um, it needs to be argumentative. So your paper can't be expository. You can't tell me all about um, Wendigos on the Appalachian Trail. I would find that fascinating, but that's not argumentative, that's expository. Expository means that you're explaining something and that's not the purpose of this paper. It is a minimum of three full pages. If you do not get to the bottom of page three, you will get points off. And I'll repeat that. If you do not get to the bottom of page three, you will get points off. If you come to me and say, Kohanim, I don't know what else to write, I can help you with that, but just know, most likely I'm gonna tell you, you should probably find some more source sources. You're supposed to have a minimum of three sources. That's a minimum. That is the bare minimum. You'll probably do better with more than three sources. Those three sources, and I'll go more, I'll go more into depth into this in the works cited, are very specific types of sources so that you can't just use like, internet-based, you know, search engines to find your research for this. Um, you have to have one book, one peer-reviewed journal article, and one news article. And I'll explain what those things are. You also have to have in-text, also known as parenthetical citations. So you will see that at the end of a quoted, and I might have it on this. Let me see if I can move that. Um, no, I, I don't have it so you can see it. So at the end of something that you quote, like at the bottom here where it says the richest man in the world, Andrew Carnegie, see how it's in quotations there? 
you would have the source in parentheses at the end. And a big mistake that people make when they're doing this is they have the source, um, but they put the entire web link or they put the title of the book when they should put the author. So doing parenthetical or in-text citations in MLA in and of itself is a skill that you need to learn to do. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, so this is the works cited page. So in addition to the three pages of content, you also need to have an MLA works cited page. So you'll see that the student put their last name and then the page number there. You'll see that it has a works cited. Notice that it says works with an S as in plural because it's more than one thing that you are citing. And then it said cited with a D, cited, past tense, cited. It's not works cites, it's not works cite, it's works cited with a D as in past tense. You'll also notice that it is in alphabetical order by their last name. You'll notice that it is double spaced, that it is 12 point times New Roman, um, and that it has hanging indents, which I will show you how to do hanging indents. You should also have a period at the end of each of your works cited entries. Other things that I want you to keep in mind, please don't use air quotes or single quotes just to emphasize things. If you're quoting something, then that's going to go into quotes, right? But when you are doing something in a paper and you're trying to emphasize it, if you put quotation marks around it or single quotation marks around it to emphasize it, that's actually not modern language association. That's not grammatically incorrect and you will get points off. Do not randomly italicize things. You are only supposed to italicize something if it's the title of a book, a play, or a movie. Um, and I'll go over spaces with you guys to talk about how to know when to underline or italicize something. Do not randomly capitalize things. Please also make sure that if it's the title of someone or someone's name, or you're using the pronoun I, that you do capitalize. If you use text speak in your final draft, you will get major points off. Please also do not have all caps for emphasis. A pro tip for you, and you will see when you look at the calendar, you're gonna have some peer workshop days built into the calendar. Have someone read your paper out loud to you because sometimes we interject articles that aren't there or pronouns that aren't there. And in our head, after we've written them, we think that they're there. And if they're not, someone else is gonna pick it up and they'll be able to read it back to you so that you can hear it. Okay, so that's the end of it. Um, again, this is the introduction to the research paper. Here's what you guys need to do now. Now you're going to take the poll. There's a form that's underneath this video and you'll see that there's a red button there. You're gonna take that form and you're gonna fill out the interest inventory, okay? Once you've filled out the interest inventory, when I get back on Thursday, I'm gonna have you guys get together and kind of brainstorm some general ideas as far as topics, subtopics, and thesis statements. Your writing assignment, remember the crucible writing assignment, that is also due today. So please make sure that you give that to the substitute teacher. You are not allowed to email it to me. Do not email it to me. You are giving that as a paper copy in hand. You have access to a printer at the media center. If that means that you need to go to the media center during your lunch and print that out, you are more than welcome to do that. But you have to make sure that you get the writing assignment to my substitute today. Okay, if you're super nervous about giving the substitute your writing assignment and you want to hold on to it until tomorrow when I get back, that's fine. Just know that I'm going to collect those at the very beginning of class. You will not have time to go print. You will not be allowed to use my printer. You have to be ready to go. All right, if you do have any questions, um, you can try emailing me. <laughs> Chances are it's not going to work just because I've got um, a whole bunch of doctor's appointments that I'm taking my brother to. Um, and he's a handful. So <laughs> he is six foot, all of 300 pounds, quite a handful. So just keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, if you need to email me and ask me some questions, that's fine. Just a quick little recap. Your writing assignment is due today, the Crucible writing assignment, which is linked on Kohanim Web, um, if you've forgotten what that is. You also need to fill out the form. If you do not fill out the form, it's going in the grade book as a practice grade, so your parents will know. And if I have to meet with your parents, I'm going to say, hey, he's not he or she is not keeping up with the practice. So just things to keep in mind and be good for the sub.